teach again, and he'll learn Kyrgyz, and then he returns back to the United States for grad school. Great. In international relations, and then, as he says, either a career in state or USAID in Central Asia, or I'll work for six, well over six figures for an oil company, <laughs> an American oil company in Kazakhstan. <laughs> right, so he's got some options. Don't you, don't you love the confidence of a 25-year-old boy who realizes, hey, my fallback is making over 150,000 working for an, for an oil, oil company. company. <laughs> Just in That's case. That's the fallback. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we are, as we always do, going to be discussing the issues and we're going to be discussing the candidates involved in town meeting day that's coming up in March. Now, I am very fortunate that I have a candidate for the Parks Commission for the five-year term whose name I cannot pronounce. My name is Kasha Ranjo. Let me try it. Kasha Ranjo. That's right. Boy, that's, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and Kasha is currently sitting on the Parks Commission. I am. I, I applied for a vacancy this fall, and so I've been on the Parks Commission since uh, October. Now, the Parks Commission is, in, in its own way, it's a separate entity. It's not like the Planning Commission, and it's not like the um, Development Commission. These are elected positions. Right. These are elected positions, and my understanding is that when Hubbard Park was uh, created and gifted to the city, um, decades ago that um, the stipulation was that there be a five-member elected body to oversee management of the parks and since then as Montpelier's parks have expanded to serve uh, the broader community and, and more than just Hubbard Park um, the the Commission has uh, continued to oversee the additional parks as well okay now what are the additional parks. <laughs> Everyone knows Hubbard Park. <laughs> what are the additionals? Um, well, no, uh, North Branch Park, of course. Okay, now where is North Branch? North Branch Park is uh, on the east side of the North Branch of the M Winooski. And so um, a lot of people access that from, say, Cumming Street neighborhood, or um, maybe you park by the recreation facilities where there's the swimming pool and the ball fields and you can go across the bridge there to access North Branch Park, and it's essentially um, the land that's on the slope of the hill um, How there. many acres roughly are, are sitting there? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I want to say it's around 100, but that's that might not be so a So it's quite almost right. half as big as, as Hubbard Park. I, b I believe that's that's pretty close. And, and what happens with North Branch, um, it's connected in a little bit with the um, you know developed recreation facilities on the other side of the river, as well as North Branch Nature Center, and then there's some connected private lands nearby um, as well. And so um, the actual you know the the space that people use is uh, it, through those connected lands is is larger than the you know the the acreage itself. What else do we have besides North Branch? There's uh, the river access site that um, is, is that on Elm Street. On Elm Street, right by um, Birch Grove Bakery, yeah. and um, you're gonna test me because I'm. I do. We've got I'm a couple <laughs> pocket parks. Don't <laughs> there are a couple pocket parks. There's the the Peace Park, um, and um, now of course um, there's a vision developing for Confluence Park downtown. Now where um, is Confluence Park? Confluence Park is uh, at the confluence of the north branch of the Winooski and the w main Winooski River. Um, and, uh, which is why it's called Confluence which Park. Which is why it's called Confluence Park. And um, unfortunately, it's been tucked away behind, uh, behind our businesses, behind our parking lots. Um, and now with the, this, this has been a community vision for over 20 years. Um, Vermont River Conservancy has really taken the lead um, to see that this is fulfilled. The city council 20 years ago said, okay, yes, we would like to do this. Um, and for various reasons, there hasn't been action on that. So now Vermont River um, Conservancy is, is really taking the lead on that and bringing multiple partners and players together to figure out the vision there. And with the construction of the new parking garage, that actually allows um, for a slightly larger park than there would otherwise be. Um, and so it's an exciting time for parks as we look at how we um, build and expand on what we have already. What is, 
what is the preliminary thought about I mean that's a very small space mm -hmm. it's a small space um, I think the idea you know um, uh, Vermont River Conservancy uh, talks about facing the river and owning the river and right now all our businesses the backs are to the river we park by the river there's a not actually a way to access the river and so um, they can tell you you know more about that vision but I think in a lot of ways it's the idea is that um, we're able to step foot in the river and uh, and see the river downtown and have community events there so maybe uh, there might be a, a, amphitheater an amphithe amphitheater type space maybe there are some benches some some picnic tables space where you could have a small musical event and have a community gathering space um, and the bike path passes through there as well so making it a community space that the community can own and celebrate and connects us with the rivers that are really are an amazing asset through town that right now are kind of pushed behind and then building off that create you know using that as a stepping stone to um, for Montpelier as a whole, as a whole um, to really adopt the river as part of its identity rather than something that we shove to the back. There's another tiny, tiny little pocket park on Nick, across from the cemetery, kind of near That's right. the underpass to the freeway. That's and right. And that is just a tiny park that no one <laughs> knows exists. Yeah, and, um, you know, I think that... Um, we have uh, this green print, which the Parks Commission has been working on for a long time, and some of the commissioners have, have really um, been hoping to bring to light. And that's kind of a vision for how our parks um, expand and meet community needs over time. And so um, that green print is looking at what are the opportunities for connecting places like that that are um, a little bit hard to access or, or kind of cut off from the rest of town what are the neighborhoods that maybe don't have access to a park? It's wonderful if you live next to Hubbard Park and can go access it every day, but what if you live on the other side of the river? What are your parks? And so the green print is looking at how we can um, connect all of our parks so that they're more accessible and not necessarily pushed off to the side, but are part of our community identity and um, a, a real asset to our, our daily lives for everybody in town. There's a tiny little parklet again, not, to, not the parklets that are in the street. There's a <laughs> tiny little micro park at the corner of Elm and Court. Yes. Uh, Is there any talk of, of small little micro parks like that one you know, in different I, parts of town? I haven't heard specifically, but I think that the idea is... Uh, behind this green print is kind of to provide connectivity and so that you might have quiet spaces like that where maybe it's a park bench but um, more than that how do you um, provide green space so that people can um, walk or bike or exercise or just sit quietly and enjoy um, and enjoy f space with their family and friends and use them as a place of connectivity whether they're big or small making sure that everybody has access. Now, in the city budget, we're picking up a position that deals with emerald bore. Yes, yeah, so there's a Could trees. Could you explain that? You know? that? So that is d separate from our parks. That's right. a trees position. So the, the trees. And then you're picking up a position in the, in the park starting in October. That's correct. So Could you explain both those? Yeah, so I'm less familiar with the trees position because it's not our management. But um, emerald ash borer is a... Um, you know, regional problem that it's only going to expand in, in the future um, as, as it populates in new parts of, of town and it's going to be um, a little unpredictable. It's a natural <laughs> threat to our trees um, and my understanding is that the trees position um, is pr primarily concerned with um, addressing our, our town trees and our city trees that, that line our streets and um, that and how we mitigate that problem but the the trees commission can tell you more about See, that now position. I'm, I'm going to put you out of your comfort zone possibly but i know this discussions come before your board what percentage of, of the north branch or hubbard are susceptible to this well anywhere there are ash trees how, how so many, well, let me rephrase <laughs> it what percent of north branch and Hubbard are ash trees. I don't have an answer well, to that. There is a, um, a, a 
a forester that the parks are working with right now um, who's putting together um, a, a study for um, a, a pot potentially a couple areas of the, of the park where they are looking at inventorying the trees of, you know, at what percentage is hemlock or beech mm -hmm, or birch mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, and what percentage is ash and kind of taking a look at that in, in a couple areas of the parks. But I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that, that question is. When you do that inventory, I know that uh, the Parks Commission has been working on signage. Yes. And not, not simply big signage, but small signage. Mm -hmm. Will that small signage identify what kind of trees are in there? Um, you know, there's um, discussion. There is a nature trail established in Hubbard Park. and Where is um, that nature trail? Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly um, I exactly its location in the park, and that's one of the problems is it's been um, kind of lesser known and, and it, its signage hasn't been elevated. Which but might I be know, good for that trail. In a sense. <laughs> but I know that um, park staff I was just talking to a couple weeks ago is, is they're interested in um, improving the signage along the nature trail in that area. And, you know, I don't think that something like signing every tree no, in no, all our parks would really make sense, but drawing, highlighting it in certain areas would make sense. I know I've seen on the path, you know, up from the Capitol building up right. to the tower, um, you can, uh, there are signs that say, hey, look up, what are, this is an ash tree, keep an eye out, here's what Emerald Ash Borer is doing and, and um, how it will affect our forests. And so that kind of um, education interwoven with our parks, I think is really important for the community. When Carolyn Dorinci was running, mm -hmm. last time I had her on, on the, she was, one of her goals was to set up a small little nature center up there. Um, I haven't heard where that, that stands. I know um, Carolyn is um, very excited about the green print um, and this vision for how we um, connect our parks and ex expand our but parks. But she had to talked about the, the educational, the open education in the park. Yeah, I, I, those conversations haven't been okay. part of the, the commission's conversations lately far as I know. In terms of signage, what do you see as the need for signage in the park, besides how to get to the park from Elm Street and the like? Yeah, well, you know, there, signage um, has a couple different avenues. There are directional signs. Um, they did a beautiful job with the signs in Hubbard Park that are um, carved and um, really fit well with the place. Um, and so I thought that project worked out really beautifully. Um, and those are directional. This is where you are. This is what this trail is. They tell you it's 0.2 miles to connect Which with. Which is great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and especially with so many interwoven trails there. Um, and then there's also signage that is um, behavioral signage. This the is canine code of the conduct. canine code of conduct, of course. Um, and so there, um, and as we have multiple uses in the parks, um, you know, they recently added um, s some more developed mountain bike trails in North Branch Park. Um, it's more and more important that there's signage so that multiple users know how, what to expect from one another and how to behave with one another. So, um, for example, this winter um, when the Parks Commission um, agreed to allow winter fat tire biking in North Branch Park, um, one so of the what is winter fat tire bike? So <laughs> I've it's seen over. <laughs> Let's try that again. What is winter fat tire biking? biking. <laughs> um, it's over snow biking. Um, and they and go very so slow from what I gather. Um, yeah, so it's, it, I, uh, I have not been on a fat tire bike um, myself, but it happens over snow. You can imagine it's, uh, depending on snow conditions, if the snow is soft, it's a bit like biking in the sand at the beach. It's um, it's challenging. Um, the tires are have a much wider tread than a mountain bike, um, and they go uphill and they cruise downhill. Um, and um, it's a, a relatively new sport, and uh, they're looking for more and more terrain. And they're not having problems with the snowshoers. Um, you know, we haven't re heard any incidents so far this year um, since since this you know, as a, a new experiment. Um, I, I did a little bit of research myself before as this discussion was going on to just see what's happening in other communities. And I think, you know, signage and how people behave is really important that the different users respect one another. Um, the, the bikes have 
uh, brakes on them, and they do go relatively slow. Um, and and um, but if they're incidents, we do have a, a form to report incidents online, and that's really important. Um, that we hear from community members to say, hey, I had a really positive experience or I had a really horrible experience and this is why. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, we're not necessarily, um, you know, the on the ground mediators all the time. And so I think it's, you know, really best if people are responsible for themselves and, um, you know, that bikes yield to pedestrians and um, people using the trails and there are signs up that say, you know, bike sealed to everybody else. And I think that, you know, following those are, that is really important to make sure everybody gets along out there and has a good time. Now in 2018, we had a new word enter our, our vocabulary, Parkapalooza. Parkapalooza. <laughs> <laughs> Would you explain what Parkapalooza is? Um, Parkapalooza. Or, or is it, it's not a was, it's, it it's a continuing that's project, right. so it still it is. Yeah, so Parkapalooza is, um, there are s multiple events in the parks every year. Parkapalooza is the big summer event that um, we put on. And no, there's, the multiple idea, part, there's multiple events. Exactly, so it's a series. Um, it, it's taken a few different forms. I believe it's in its third year or so now. Um, and um, they've tried it on different you know, days and, and scenarios and things like that. Um, I believe the idea this year is that it happen um, one Saturday a month um, for June, July, August, and September, I believe, but don't quote me on that. Um, and um, the, the, they're starting the planning now. The idea is to have um, family-friendly um, events in the park where people can come in, enjoy the park in a new way, um, make it as a, a community gathering point and a, and a hub for um, people to enjoy Montpelier and bring in people out of town who want to stay in town. Does that include um, camping? In the it park? does. New this year. Um, they uh, have experimented with this a little bit in the past, but I believe the idea this year is to uh, per, uh, allow camping in Hubbard Park um, each of the Saturdays that they have Park Palooza this summer. Um, and so it's a really great experience. It's a, it's a great chance for people who live in town to experience the park in, the, in a new way and set up a tent. I mean, even if you live in town and you don't need to camp out, bring a tent, bring your sleeping bag, camp out overnight, see what it's like to, to hear owls at night or um, you know, listen to the forest and, and um, experience the park in, in, under moonlight and starlight. And um, for people from out of town, it's a really, unique way to experience our state capital. How many state capitals can you go and uh, you know spend your day in downtown, enjoying the businesses, walk into the woods, have enjoy a music concert, roll out your sleeping bag and camp you know just behind the capital essentially. When we talk about behind the capital, I believe that 2019 will finally bring the wayfaring sign that will point to the park. From the state capitol. <laughs> I hope so. I haven't. I haven't heard the the timeline. I mean, that's that's on that, been but long, that long overdue. <laughs> but I think that um, we have currently have off of Court Street a green sign that points up into the park. Right. To that's Court right. Street. Yep. Uh, there've been long discussions on whether there should be one on Elm Street in both directions mm -hmm. to point into the meadows and then point up into mm -hmm. the park to make it easier for people from out of town to actually realize Access. where the park is. Right. And um, you know, I've, I've, um, our parks are an incredible asset, especially Hubbard Park. I, I know people talk about all the time, and I think for people visiting, that being able to access the parks like that is a really unique experience for for the Montpelier experience of um, you know spending time in town and immediately out of town being able to have that kind of wild natural experience. I think it's really unique. And See now we're in the winter right now. This is being taped, as you know, <laughs> this is being taped in February. Um, the meadow is our snow hill. That's right. It's, it's our snowboard, <laughs> uh, not snowboard, but it's, it's our Sledding sled hill. hill. Yeah. Must be a great year for sledding for the kiddos. It's it's fantastic. There um, there are a lot of kids out there. Um, I my daughter is two, so she's not quite ready for the big hill yet. She's uh, you know taking things slow and trying out the little hills around town. Um, so I haven't tried it out myself yet. But when I've um, walked by, there's there are certainly plenty of kiddos out there. 
which is great. Yes. Now during the non-snow season, there's a stage. Um, so that's where Park Balooza is held, is, is just at the top of that sledding hill there where there's um, a brand new stage that's been built and um, yeah, to yeah, host Park Palooza. But um, my understanding is that people, it, you know, the park also hosts um, community gatherings and community organizations or family events. So there are multiple shelters and I believe you could probably um, arrange to, to use the stage as well as park infrastructure. And so now those facilities can be reserved. if you want to use park infrastructure, uh, if you want to rent one of the shelters, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Um, there's, uh, there are forms online, I believe, and the Office of Community Services helps to support the, the parks um, to, you know, organize the, the rental system and, and, um, and the rentals are very modest. Yes, it's a very low, uh, low, low fee for the, the amazing amenities that we have in the park. What's coming in new? What, what kind, besides, I didn't get to the position. We have a new position coming in October, which will be new. Um, what is yes. that person going to be doing? So um, right now, um, the, the park staff has been Jeff Bear, who's been a, um, director of the parks um, for 35 years, I believe. Um, and he's indicated that he's interested in retiring soon. And so... Which um, opens up a house <laughs> in the park. <laughs> um, and um, Alec... Um, has been really fantastic and has been working by Jeff's side for, for years. Um, and um, so, so um, he, he's, he's been with the parks for a long time. Um, but this shuffling, um, both Jeff and Alec, a portion of their time is spent on trees. And so um, right now it's been less than two full-time staff people who have been managing Montpelier's parks. And it's a big job, especially um, you know, as our trails are expanding and, and, and adding new trails in North Branch, adding in potentially new parks like Confluence down the road, um, the work to, to maintain trails and keep them open, um, manage the public, keep, build and put up signs, keep all the equipment operating, the, the snowmobiles and the groomers and the trucks and, um, it's, and, and coordinate volunteers. We have a lot of volunteer groups who are out every year um, and so all that takes time. And your VISTA people. And the VISTA people, yeah. And all that time, it takes time to um, recruit volunteers, line them up, manage them, and you get, you know, the, the benefits of the volunteer support for the parks, but somebody has to do that. And so um, now, um, as of uh, a few weeks ago, the city council is uh, has a, a, a approved in the, the budget that is, uh, that is up, for, up vote. for vote, and you can see Ann Watson discussing that budget on ORCA, <laughs> on Montpelier City Forum. Um, and in that budget is a new uh, parks position, and that would allow, uh, a, for the first time, additional support. So there would be um, more than two staff people able to do all this work. Um, it's really grown over the years. Um, Montpelier has invested in its parks, and... Um, uh, I think Montpelier residents are really proud of our parks, and um, and it's time that we invest in our park staff. And so the the city council has decided that's the way to go, and and so that's proposed in the budget. What are friends of the park? Um, you know, I um, it's a as far as I know, it's a not it was a nonprofit organization that um, has been a, you know f fundraising. It's it's been active and inactive over the years. Um, as with a lot of volunteer-run organizations, it, it ebbs and flows. Um, my understanding is that they haven't been very active recently, um, but I'm, I'm, I might be wrong about that. But um, I believe it's a, a support group that you know, is, is designed to help support the parks, but I, I haven't interacted with anybody from Friends of the Parks. Everyone who runs for park commission I talk to on these shows, and I always ask the same question, as I mentioned with Carolyn. What's your vision? What if you had one project you wanted to bring before that commission that you haven't brought already? <laughs> that's that's fairly visionary and long term. Yeah. From your own personal experience, what you were involved in conservation for a long while. Yeah, that's right. I work in conservation. I've um, 
I have worked for the Forest Service on the ground. I um, have built trails, uh, been involved with trail crews, um, and currently I actually um, work remotely for Montana Wilderness Association. And That's pretty I've been remote. With them. <laughs> yeah, and I've I've been with them on um, in, in in one form or another for almost ten years now. And um, and so conservation is my passion, and and I've seen how. Um, uh, conservation and parks can transform communities and um, to me um, um, I'm really excited this actually just came up last night at our last Parks Commission meeting um, I'm really excited about um, bringing community members together to chart uh, to chart that vision together and um, across multiple user groups and multiple interests um, to think about what our parks could be and I think now you're um, thinking beyond Hubbard exactly and I think sometimes you know including um, Hubbard of course including Hubbard and the, and the time that I've been on the Commission which is uh, five or so months now um, I you know I mountain bike interests will come and, and share a vision for adding more trails or People who want their dogs on leash come. People who want dogs off leash come. And there are these various requests from the community. And I think um, when you're looking at a single parcel of ground and one park at a time, it's hard to find room for everybody and figure out where all those pieces intersect. But I think if we can zoom out and look at Montpelier as a whole and look at our entire city limits and not just the parks that exist now, but parks that could exist, Maybe we could have a park on the other side of the river that is closer to other neighborhoods and provides day-to-day -day access for families who live on that side of the river. What could that look like? And so I'm interested in um, a concept that we just started to float around at, the, at our meeting last night. We're developing what this would look like, um, but potentially you know, just bringing voices together to find common ground and, and develop a shared vision for our parks. Now you guys don't control Dog River, do you? Uh, no. Okay, and you don't control Although that recreation field that has <laughs> the baseball park on it. That's correct. But those are areas those of, are the of, of recreation. Yes, yeah, so those are the um, recreation committee um, manage the, manages those more developed areas. So. Um, you know, the skate park and the ball fields and um, the, you know, tennis courts and things like that are under a different commission. Do you control that path uh, beyond Montpelier High School that goes to the, I suppose, to the Peace Park? You know, I am not entirely sure. Um, it has not been discussed recently at our Parks Commission meeting, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I was just um, curious how far your reach is. Yeah, the, you know, if you go to the parks website, there's mm -hmm. a full listing of all the, the parks there. Um, and um, it just hasn't been a, a priority under discussion recently, so I'm not sure. I know this path. waxes and wanes. Has anyone discussed Sabin's Pasture as, as a park? You know, that comes up as a community idea that's obviously private land and, and um, the landowner you know, has has a, a you know their own ideas of the future of that land, but um, it's a beloved community space. People use it and enjoy it, and the community has been really um, privileged to uh, you know be allowed to enjoy that property for so long. So, um, you know, I think if there were an opportunity, it would be um, you know people talk about it as a possible addition to our park system, but of course that's requires you know a, a, a landowner and, and agreement or way, and, or, and funds and or way else. east on Terra Street yeah and, that, and this is one. right and th these are the types of things that in um, the green print which has been established or way and, west. I should say um, way west on Terra Street sorry <laughs> you mentioned Carolyn and she's been a really strong voice for the green print and as all are all the parks commissioners I would say but um, the the green print um, is the rough outlines of a vision of where there could be additional parks without um, saying this particular parcel of land that's owned by this landowner, which has a lot of complications, um, saying, hey, when the opportunity arises, when, um, you know, 
there's land available, when we have the funds for it, how, you know, this, this is a type of space that we could grow into so that every, no matter where you live in town, it's easy access and just a short walk to access a local park. Now, it, it seems to me that when we're talking about the green print, how does the public see the green print? Where, where is the green print? <laughs> well, that's a good question, and that's one of the things that um, we're trying to um, surface is whether, um, you know, there have been discussions before my time of whether that belongs in zoning or whether that belongs in city planning, and so we're having discussions to figure out where that lives. Um, and how people can be aware of, of, of that. But it's a park commission um, priority. And it's a park commission priority, but um, you know, and, and part of that is having these, you know, community discussions to make people aware that it exists and and um, figuring out how to bring that forward into our planning efforts. So we're talking the long term. Yes. There is an elephant in the room in this discussion. Actually it's What's not that? an elephant, it's a canine. <laughs> Canines in the park. They come up all the time. That's why it's the canine <laughs> that's sitting in the room. Would you discuss canines in the park? Yeah. And what, what the status is, your understanding of that, of how to allow for differing communities with yeah. differing priorities to yeah. coexist. Um, you know, I should stay, say right off the bat that I am a canine owner. I, I have a, um, a black lab and um, along with half the town. <laughs> yeah, along with half the town. But um, and, and I, I use the park, I, and, and um, I'm in Hubbard with her off leash. But I also feel like dog owners have responsibility as dog owners. It's a privilege to bring your dog in the park off leash, and that's something that all dog owners need to take responsibility for. And so, um, you know. It, if it's responsibility our, in what sense? Responsibility to clean up after the dog? Yeah, so being aware, um, I always carry bags with me to pick up my dog's poop and um, being aware of where your dog is at all times. So it's really easy if you're walking a trail, your dog goes to do its thing someplace, maybe you don't notice. That's not an option. You need to be responsible, responsible to pick that up. Command, uh, isn't that voice command? Isn't one of the canine code of conduct is the dog has to be under voice command? Yes, that's right. But I think um, even if they're under voice command, you know, they may be going off trail to do their thing or whatnot. So, um, and I, um, I think it's also, you know, I, I, we all love our dogs. Um, I love my dog. I don't necessarily love everyone else's dog. <laughs> and so um, I think we need to be aware that not everyone loves our dog. Even if they have another dog, they don't necessarily want to be interacting with our dog. And so when we cr come across other the people in the park, bringing our dogs close, keeping them under control, um, making sure that they're not in the, getting in the way of other people, um, and um, not causing a hazard to other people and, and that everybody has a really positive experience in the park because it's not a park for dogs, it's not a park for dog owners, it's a park for everybody. Is there a possibility of dog trails that are clearly marked so that if people have issues with dogs that they won't encounter, except yeah. on the core trail, you know, right. on the big trails, but on smaller trails there will only be dogs on lead? Yeah. You know, these are the kind of solutions that I think if we brought people together from across the community and not just dog owners, but people who don't own, own dogs, people who bike, people who ski, people who are joggers and runners and walkers and everybody together, these are the kind of solutions that we could come up with together. But I've seen, you know, other communities address it all different ways, you know. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a possibility where, it, you know, in our parking areas, at least, that dogs need to be on leash. And, you know, in the, oftentimes I, I see at trailheads that dogs are excited, they're exuberant, and that's where a lot of incidents occur. Um, as people are getting their kid and their stuff and everything else, out of their car, they're not necessarily paying attention to their dog and, and being responsible dog owners. So, uh, you know, asking dogs to be unleashed in a parking area might be part of a solution. Maybe having a, you know, specific dog areas. Um, and I don't think... Would um, that be a fenced in area? I, I, I have no, I mean, these are ideas that have come up from the community and I don't think it's my place to sit sure. and say, hey, this is what's best for, for this town. But I what I would like to see is see people come together and discuss and understand each other 
and um, you know and, and understand the, the the situation and um, you know um, Jeff Bear with um, who's the parks director now was just um, I think really thoughtfully sharing some ideas just last night at our Parks Commission meeting about um, you know education and maybe there are opportunities for um, dog owners to be better ambassadors in the park and to you know in a responsible positive way um, you know I as an example you know if I see somebody else carrying a bag of dog poop just saying hey thank you so much for picking up your dog's poop rather than the negative of like hey you didn't you didn't do this and I'm calling you out that um, you know just it, it makes people defensive and so maybe there are ways that we can all be ambassadors and help educate one another about how to be you know responsible and, and positive users of the park no matter what you're doing there. So you believe this problem will never be solved totally <laughs> but you believe that there are steps that could be taken of course that yeah. would improve the situation yeah. and, and soothe nerves. Yeah and to me I mean I think the first part of any solving any problem is bringing people together and having a conversation and um, you know and, and and without that I think that it's just easy to be defensive and point fingers or um, get riled up and I think everybody has a place in our, our parks and everybody deserves to have a, a great time there and, and, and feel safe so how do how can we do that and I think there are solutions. Uh, the trailhead on behind the state capitol and smoking dope and drinking and all yeah. of that stuff that you just don't want to see in a park. Yeah. How is that being dealt with? Um, you know, I know that it's something that everybody is aware of um, and I'm sure our police force is aware of it and, and park staff, but um, you know, every community is going to have those dark corners and in, in our community is a, you know, park space. Um, so I, um, I, I joined the commission, you know, in, in October, November time. And so, um, you know, I think it's not as much of a issue, issue as it summertime. is in the summer. So right. it hasn't really come up yet. So I don't know the exact solutions or, um, you know, the, how that gets dealt with, but, um, I, I'm, I'm, I've seen it. I know it's an issue. Uh, do we anticipate that the entrance coming in from, um, Elm Street, through Winter Street, you know, through the meadows. Will the mud season open that by June <laughs> this year? I don't I mean, know. It's, it, that, that entrance is going to be real tricky yeah. for a while this year. Yeah, I, I, I mean, everybody does the best they can, right? <laughs> so. Well, I thank you so very much. Realizing, of course, that you are not opposed for your five year <laughs> term. I thank you for coming in and discussing this with us. Everyone is interested in our parks. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I would say to anybody listening, if anybody has thoughts or feedbacks or questions, um, I'm open and, and um, glad to, to hear from the community and, and open to these conversations. So um, let's keep it going. Let me remind everyone to get out and vote on town meeting day because it is important. Even if there are no contested races, <laughs> it is important that you become civically engaged and uh, watch the other episodes that we have of Montpelier City Forum. They're all good. And thank you very much for watching.